One thing that I always told people working um, on Capitol Hill when I answered the phones, not everyone's calling. Our, and you know your elected officials are hearing from the public, but they're hearing from a very small group, yeah. normally who have like a, um, a minority viewpoint on something, but that's who's really driving the interest of um, what the elected official thinks the larger community believes in. So make your voice heard as well. Hey, JKP crew, what a joy this conversation with Shaniqua was for me. She's the VP of politics at Crooked Media. She tells me all about what Crooked Media's vision is, how folks like you and I can work on the things we feel are broken in our political system. She gives us really good action items that we can all work on. And for me, though, the biggest treat was learning about her journey, what growing up was like, how that propelled her to get to where she is today. There's themes of going beyond her wildest dreams and manifesting a powerful life for herself, which I'm so, so happy about. So enjoy this one. She's wonderful. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, look at your background. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so happy to see you. It's the cycling class. (laughs) I know, I know. I was like, man, how long has it been? (laughs) And now he's retired. I know, we gr- I know. I loved getting his email, his like retirement email. Ah, oh, so many good memories. We should do a reunion. Where do that you would live be nice. right now? I live in DC. Um, um, no, I actually left LA a year ago. I moved here about a year ago from LA. So um, yeah, even okay. I've been back to LA probably five or six times since then, but I am here. Beautiful. We actually may visit a friend in Baltimore. Her husband's oh. a resident at Johns Hopkins this mm-hmm. summer. So if we do that, I will hit yeah. you up. It'll be Let nice to know. see you in person. Yeah. Yay. All right. Did you bring something of comfort with you today? Curious. Okay. So <laughs> this may not be exactly what you were thinking, but <laughs> this okay. sweatshirt and chair are like my favorite Ooh. things. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you like, I had to lower the shade because the it doesn't look that good but like I just like sitting next to this window and like doing yeah. whatever I can in this chair so this is like the perfect place and this sweatshirt is just very cozy so you yeah know, um that is actually I the word cozy is just something I use all the time like if I feel cozy <laughs> then I'm in a good yeah. place that might be like this chair and sweatshirt I also um I got this down blanket on um down comfort on uh, Black Friday and yeah. it's like perfect. I love going to sleep. I like turn the heat down so I can just like wrap myself in the blanket. So just whatever makes me cozy. And these are two things that make me feel cozy. I, I'm all about it, Shaniqua. I am all about like the touch, the way things feel. Mm-hmm. I also have a blanket that is like the softest thing ever that I love cuddling <laughs> with. Uh, and then your chair. This is like animal print. This is like yes. leopard print. I'm yes. into it. You know, it's funny. My mother growing up, I mean, I think it was overkill, but she had like a leopard uh, bedspread set and (laughs) curtains and just like everything. She like loved it so much. And I just thought it was so tacky. And then I started getting older and I was like, man, I have like leopard shoes, sweaters. This chair now is probably the the boldest statement. But, you know, they say you become your parents as you get older. Uh. Totally. But it's a nice statement piece. I love it. It it gives bold personality to your space. (laughs) Thank you. So happy to have you here. So for folks who are not as familiar, you're the VP of politics at Crooked Media, and Mm -hmm. we'll dive into that in a bit. But before we go there, I wanted to talk about your background growing up. So if we rewind all the way to baby Shaniqua, little <laughs> girl Shaniqua, can you describe to me what growing up was like for you? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting you asked that question because I like wrote about that in the class we took together. Um, and that was my first piece to ever be published. Great. Um, <laughs> Everyone should go so, read the piece. <laughs> yes. Well, it's called it's called Baby Steps. It's in um, Boston Globe magazine. I think that was Amazing. 2017 when it was published. Um, But I actually wrote that article. I was inspired to write it because I found out my younger sister was pregnant. Um, And it just made me start reflecting on growing up with a single mother. Um, Mm -hmm. 
and that that would probably be the experience my younger sister had and and you know just grappling with the fact that I felt like it would be hard for her but it really made me process um because the first version of that uh essay was very much like asking why is my sister going to embark on single motherhood you know and then I started to dig a little deeper and it was a question of okay well why am I having such a strong reaction to this and it's because I was the product of a single mother and it, it wasn't that easy. You know, my parents, um, they, they were married when they, I have a twin sister. They were married when they had me and my twin sister, but they were 19 when they had me and my twin sister. And so, you know, I think it's the thing people uh, did back then. You're pregnant, yeah. you get married, you know, it's, it's what you do. Um, but their marriage was not great. There was a lot of arguing. Um, you know, I saw that at a young age and, you know, I've worked through a lot of that with with my therapist, but seeing that is hard when you're young. Um, so yeah, my uh, parents ended up splitting up when uh, me and my twin sister were nine years old, and my younger sister was four years old because she's five years younger than us. Mm -hmm. um, and we moved to North Carolina, where my mother's side of the family is from. We moved in with my grandmother, who lived in um, she lived in a three bedroom house, but our uncle, her brother, lived in one of the rooms and kind of stayed to himself, and then the four of us <laughs> shared two bedrooms yeah um and you know there was one bathroom so just a lot of people in one house um and I mean that definitely was not easy I found out later you know the first job my mother had um I, I knew this she worked at KFC for like two days because she did not like it yeah um and you know, obviously she needed a job, but I didn't want her working at a fast food place. Mm -hmm. And she eventually went to work as an administrative assistant. Wait, at, this was uh, you as a nine-year-old being like, I don't want my mom working at a fast food. Yeah, Already yeah. so opinionated. <laughs> I know. Thought. It's like, <laughs> don't you need to eat? Like, <laughs> um, And I think it's because when we lived in New York, um, the last job she had before we left, um, which as an adult, I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't even like think about what that meant. She actually worked at Planned Parenthood, like in some uh -huh. kind of HQ or something, which now makes so much sense. She had like the talk with me and my twin sister when we were like eight years old and mm -hmm. she had all these pamphlets and we were yeah. just sitting on the couch like mortified because she's like got all this like really intense stuff from Planned Parenthood to yeah, teach I us bet. about sex. And <laughs> oh, we're just like, we God. don't even know what this is. My mom had the talk with me at like 15 and I was mortified. I can't imagine <laughs> eight years old. Thank goodness you had your sister. I know we were just sitting there. And I think it's my mother was always someone who, um, I mean, one, she had us at 19. So yeah. she always said like, I trust you all, but I know my like childhoods, I don't put anything past you. And I just want to make sure you have all the information mm -hmm. um, that you need. Um, and, you know, I did not use that information for some time. Um, <laughs> but you had but it. I, I did have it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, in North Carolina, um, so she had that big office job in New York. And so when we got to North Carolina, I wanted her to have another office job because that was the way it was supposed to be. And I think that... Um, Working at KFC to me meant that people could see that we didn't have a lot. But if she went into an office job, people couldn't tell. Uh, even though I found out later she was making $22,000 a year in that office job at uh, Wachovia, which is uh, Wells Fargo now. Yeah. Um, and she ended up having to pick up a second job in yeah. food service um, at Domino's Pizza, delivering pizzas. And again, you know, I struggled with that, which... Again, children don't always understand things. She did what she had to do to make sure that her three children were okay. But she delivered pizza to my classmate's house. And I remember one time in particular, this, you know, happened to my sister, my twin sister. Her fifth grade teacher had um, a sleepover for all the uh, girls in the class. And they ordered pizza. And my mother ended up being the person who delivered the pizza. And so those were the kinds of things where... I was okay if we were struggling and no one knew, but I did not want the whole world and like all of my classmates to know that. And, um, you know, it just, I think it propelled me to work really hard in school, which I'm glad I worked hard, but I, I do hate that that is the reason that I was always like striving for more to like prove to people that like, you know, whatever they thought about our situation, like I was smart, I was hardworking, like I could do whatever they were doing. It didn't matter what was going on at home. And it shaped a lot of, I think, my adulthood. 
I was always striving to like prove to people that I was worthy of their affection and, and love and, and just, you know, friendship, anything. And when, when that is the space you operate from, it's not healthy because you're just trying to please other people and what you need uh, gets lost in the shuffle. And, um, you know, we also, at one point we were living in a two bedroom apartment and my mother's friends wanted to move to North Carolina. So she let them stay with us until they could get on their feet, but it was her friend and her two kids. And so now there's seven of us living in a two bedroom apartment. And so it just, it was a lot. Um, and I know she tried to be there for her friends and family, but it did take a toll on us. But she also was just like our biggest cheerleader. The reason she worked two jobs is so we could do as many extracurricular activities as possible. In middle school, we went on a big field trip every year. In eighth grade, we went to uh, Disney World and there's two of us. So she always had to figure out a way to make sure that both of us could go. So as I got older, you know, in writing that piece, it really just kind of crystallized for me that I had been a bit embarrassed about a lot of my childhood and it just pushed me to like, build up my resume and have this story about myself that, you know, I'm great. Don't worry about all that stuff in my past. Like I'm here now. I'm successful. This is what you should care about. Uh, but I, I just, now that I've been able to reflect more, all of those experiences like made me who I am. And in, in 2010, my mother actually passed away and it just made me really, really reflect on everything and see more of like her compassion, um, how hardworking she was and just willing to do anything for her kids um, and gave me a, it's funny, I feel like since she's died, I've one, gotten a fuller, pic, fuller picture of who she is. And I've just been able to process our relationship more um, in a way that, like, I don't know what it would have looked like or how that would have happened if she was still alive. Shaniqua, y your mom is so strong from what you're describing, having to take care of the four of you and then being so generous to even get her friends to come on board. And I see yeah. so much of that fierceness and strength in you right now as you're talking. Oh, thank you. I like we know each other. We know each other through a class and I just one class. So not even that well, but I know you a little <laughs> bit. And this makes so much more sense, kind of your fierceness and your willpower, um, but also your thank ability you. to help others. And it's it, you're like a big, bright, shining light. I feel oh, so much. Thank you. Adoration for you. It's really nice. It's the truth. Um, and how is your relationship with your sisters, your twin yeah, sister and your baby um, sister? Yeah, my twin sister, um, it's, 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 I'm not going to call it weird now, but like we did everything together. Um, so I don't mean weird in a bad way, just that like, we're not kids who literally do everything together anymore. Um, we yeah, both work at adults. We, exactly. And, you know, <laughs> I think when we went to college is when it was like, oh, we're not like attached to the hip anymore because we made a deliberate decision to go to different colleges. Um, and then the twin, like we both had twins at our schools who were like, of course we went to the same school. And we were like, <laughs> Oh, I guess we're like a little different. Um, but the relationships are good. Um, you know, my, my twin sister is married now. And so that's when I said it's weird. It's because it's different now. You know, she has someone else who's like always there, who she calls first for things. Um, and it's okay that I'm not that person. Yeah. Um, and her husband is- It's healthy is, is too, great. right? For you to be yes, growing exactly. as individuals with your own interests yeah. and not needing to be all the time together. Yeah. No. And I imagine that her husband would be weirded out if I was like, you know, the third wheel all the time um, <laughs> in, in their marriage. Um, but it's been, um, you know- when she was in graduate school, she went to Howard for her MBA. I was living up here in DC and we lived together. I'm really happy we got that time together because it was the last time we got to live together and just, you know, I don't know, be adults as sisters because, you yeah. know, we left high school and then went to, or, to different colleges. Um, and I think that we, I think maybe we were like 24, 25 when we were living together then. And just, you know, a lot had happened in that time. Like a lot happens between 17 and 24. Um, and we were experiencing those things separately with, you know, friends, but not necessarily with um, each other who had been together all that time. And so it was good to get to know each other as adults and just be able to to be friends, like separate from being sisters, but just have that adult uh, friendship. And my younger sister, we are in a much better place now. I'll be honest. Um we struggled a bit in the last few years and 
I've, I've talked to my therapist a lot about this. Something that she has struggled with is when it's weird because I have a twin sister, but it was when I left for college, you know, she always says you left and you, you didn't call, you didn't like come back a lot. And, um, and just how unfair that was. And one thing that I really tried to impress upon her was that I know that she valued having me there, but my mother worked two jobs. So a lot of responsibility was put on me, even though we were, I have a twin sister. I was treated as the oldest. Um, I mean, I am the oldest by 19 minutes, but that's not like, you know, <laughs> huge counted. in the grid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I cooked dinner a lot. I was cleaning up. And as I got older and still had to do those things, I was in extracurricular activities. I had my own job. And so by the time I went to college, I was like, I, you yeah. know, I am going to college. I'm going to finally like just have to worry about myself and, and you know, Which is be also irresponsible. Healthy. But yeah, yeah. But, you know, my younger sister didn't process it that way and saw it um, as something that was harmful to her. And because of that, that resentment manifested in different ways in our relationship where we got into some pretty ugly arguments, quite frankly. Um, and one um, happened, I, I think it was during COVID. I mean, still during COVID, but at the height of it. And we just stopped speaking for about a year and a half. Um, and she she tried to reconcile a few times, but it was hard for me because I I knew our relationship had been shaky and I was making a concerted effort to rebuild it. And then we had this huge argument where she just said some things that I, I just, I just, you know, did not think, um, I, I thought she crossed the line. Um, and so we've, you know, some time went by and we started to speak again. And for me, a big part of it was I wasn't getting time with my nephew um, who, you know, he knew who my twin sister was. And I felt like, wow, does he even know he has another aunt? Um, because I wasn't talking to my sister and I was in LA at the time, so I wasn't, you know, I would see him over the holidays, but but that was it. And having a relationship uh, with him is is very important to me. And so, you know, we were able to make up and get to a better place. And, you know, now my uh, nephew knows he has two aunts and, you know, I don't know how, but at four years old, he knows how to FaceTime us <laughs> um, and will just like call us and say, hey, aunties, what you doing? Um, so that's good. That's beautiful. It's all, it's so tough, especially like y'all had like a lot going on growing up. And it sounds like maybe your baby sister almost transferred that motherly relationship to you yeah, and felt yeah. hurt. And at the same time, I can totally see how you needed time to yourself because you've been taking care of yeah. everyone. And so I think it's tough, especially with these family relationships where you have so many, so many things underneath the surface yeah, so where many the layers. emotions get triggered. But I'm so happy mm -hmm. to hear that y'all are doing better now. And I love the nephew. I have four nieces and they're oh, wow. the joy of my my world. <laughs> so I can't even imagine what it's like for you to have this your nephew in your life. Mm -hmm. it, it it's wonderful. Yeah, it's the best. So then, how amidst all of this, Shaniqua, did you get interested in politics? Yeah. Um. So I have always been very like aware of um you know growing up poor, but my first reaction to that was. Let me find a job that will pay me a lot of money so that I never have to worry about that again. And in college, I majored in um, business and journalism. And my intern my summer internships were all in financial services. And my first internship actually led to a job. I worked at a bank doing like market research, but during the school year, they would let me, um, you know, be a bank teller. But that just opened my eyes to a lot of uh, bad things in, in society. I spent a lot of time working in a bank in downtown Durham, North Carolina, uh, which looks very different now from when I grew up there. But, you know, we had these sales goals. We had to get people to open checking accounts and get money markets and, and credit cards. And that was part of the metrics they measured my success by. And so I would do it, but I felt awful about it because there were people who were coming into the bank who didn't have bank accounts. And charging them, you know, they had to make a choice. Either we we're going to charge them $5 to cash their check, or they had to put $100 into an account to open it. $100 is a lot for people yeah. um, 
especially if they have to wait three days to access it so the account can kind of clear. And I, I just, I felt a lot of, um, you know, just uh, confliction about doing that. And then my final internship was at Credit Suisse and I was in their operations um, department. And, you know, I was just, if I remember my job correctly, I was making sure all of the internal and external information matched up that clients were seeing. But what I also saw is those clients, they had a ton of money, yeah. <laughs> uh, amounts of money that, you know, I could not even put my my head around. And on top of that, our intern class was not that diverse, which was the same experience I had at the business school at UNC. And it just made me think a little deeper that, yes, I grew up poor, but I'm not the only one. And it wasn't because my mother chose that life for us. There were a lot of decisions that um, leaders in our country, especially politicians, were making that put a lot of people in that position. And kind of what pushed me over the edge was reading um, The World is Flat in my uh, global marketing class. Mm. And we had to pick a chapter and write a paper on it. And so I decided to write a paper on um, chapter eight, I believe. I can't remember the title of chapter eight, but it was about education. And it made me reflect on the fact that education was what had gotten me to this point. I had been very fortunate um, and, and done well in school, but a lot of people had not had that opportunity. And I always saw that as the reason they weren't able to access the same opportunities as me. And so that's what pushed my interest in education policy. Uh, and then my senior year, Barack Obama was running for president. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like I had this interest in education policy and then he ran for president and I was obsessed. Um, right. It's like you can see point... yourself in a leader for the first time. Yes. It and it inspires amazing. you mm -hmm. <laughs> to do things. Same here. Um, yeah. And so I ended up, I remember I voted for him in the primary and I kept saying, I know Hillary Clinton's going to win, but I just have to give him my vote. Like he has to get my vote. And then he ended up winning and it, it just <laughs> yeah. felt so exciting um, and then my boyfriend at the time, so I had already graduated, um, and my boyfriend at the time sent me a White House internship application, and I thought, okay, well, I have to do this. Yeah. I wanted to move to D.C. really bad just to be there because I had visited and enjoyed it. Um, never thought it would be for a White House internship, and I applied, and then I got the first email that like, okay, send us more material. And it just kept going. And I was just thinking, there's no way this is about to happen. And then I was working at Macy's at the time and I saw I had a voicemail and then I looked at my email and it said I had gotten the internship ah. and I ran around <laughs> the entire store, just so excited. Um, and that was an experience, but all in all, you know, getting that internship is really what solidified my interest in politics. The Affordable Care Act was passed while I was um, a White House wow. intern, and just seeing all of that was amazing. And the thing that made me want to go to Capitol Hill. Um, okay, wait, I just have to share these two stories. Yes, about, tell us. So I worked in, <laughs> I worked in the student correspondence office. Um, and so any letter from someone under 17 would come into uh, that office. And the two letters that stick out to me, it, it also solidified my interest in education policy because we got a lot of letters about poor infrastructure, no more physical ed or music classes. The two letters that stand out to me forever, um, one kid asked um, why there was so much air in chip bags and if the president <laughs> could do anything about that. And then so the true. other, it, it is, I mean, it should be illegal how much air I is know, in those. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then the second one was if uh, President Obama could get Lindsay Lohan out of jail. <laughs> and so this kid was just like invested um, in Lindsay Lohan. Um, but, you know, overall, um, it pushed me to want to work on Capitol Hill. I know that President Obama was, you know, the architect and the person who really um, pushed for the Affordable Care Act to get passed. But it doesn't become law if it doesn't go through Congress. And watching Nancy Pelosi just, you know, mightily handle that uh, process. I remember being up at, I don't know what time in the morning, it was <laughs> one or two o'clock in the morning, just watching the house floor, like, this is amazing. Like, this is what She's I would love to do. such a badass. Oh my God. It's like, yeah, I'm... I know. I don't even know what it's going to be like with her. Without, I mean, she's still there now, it. but like when she yeah. actually leaves. Um, but yeah, and then my mother, 
I um I always say this was her parting gift to me. Um, so this was May of 2010. I told her I really want to work on the Hill, and she connected me with her coworker son, and he had worked on the Hill. Um, and so he had a conversation with me, and then he told me this will probably be one of the last times you chat with me because he was going dark to study for the bar, mm. and I only had his work information, and he was leaving this job, and. So, you know, he ends the call and he's like, Shaniqua, um, I don't want anything from you. And you seem like a really smart woman. The only thing I ask is that you pay it forward. None of us get to where we are alone without anyone's help. And that has stuck with me. Um, but anyway, I later found out after I start working for Kay Hagen, uh, two or three years after I start working for her, that he's the person who sent my resume into her office. Um, and... I finally, three years later, get to meet him in person. I get his contact information and we meet for, um, we meet for lunch and we end up spending three hours together, just like talking. And it was just, it it was great. Um, and he, yeah. I always tell him like, you are the reason that I was able to get that job. And, you know, it was one of the last things my mother, um, did for me, um, before she passed away. And I literally would not like, be sitting here. I wouldn't have this job. I wouldn't be in politics um, if if that didn't happen. And so I'm just always grateful yeah. um, to them. And I don't know if Jake is a Republican or not, but I mean, I, I sense that he might be. I could be completely wrong, but it's one of the things I hold on to. Sometimes I hope he is so I can hold on to the fact that like there's still like mm-hmm. just good people regardless of their, um, Party. you know, politics. They yeah. just want to, you know, help people and, and be nice. Yeah. We're all human beings at the end of the day and we can see the goodness yeah. in each other. It's, it's such a beautiful yeah. thing. I was so struck, Shaniqua, where you started with the fact that you were poor and you didn't want to be poor anymore and you just wanted to not have to worry about money because I resonate. So I grew up in Sierra Leone. It's the seventh poorest country in the world. And I so resonate with that feeling of just like wanting this sense of safety that for me, it's like that I have shelter, that I don't have to worry about my home and where I'm living. And I don't like have to worry for my personal safety. So Mm -hmm. I really, really resonate with that about the money as well. And then it it makes a difference. It does. It does. Especially for folks that grow up without it. Um, Yeah. And then what you mentioned about, like, it's so crazy how you couldn't see this really for yourself, this life, but then seeing Barack Obama as an example, and then, whoa, he got elected. And then God bless this ex-boyfriend who sent you this internship (laughs) because it sounds like you weren't even Everybody serves a purpose. Yeah. (laughs) And, and it got you there. And it's, it's wild how there's so many of these moments for us in life where, for instance, like where Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't even think this could be an opportunity for me and someone pushes me to try it and it and it opens Mm -hmm. up these doors and so i guess what i want to highlight for listeners is moral of the story surround yourself with people who push you who believe in you and believe in yourself most importantly Mm -hmm. um yeah and and pay it forward as well and and with all these people i think it was jake who helped you along the way and and when you Mm -hmm. get helped lift others up to because we definitely don't get where we are just by ourselves. It's a community. It's a exactly. village effort. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So today as VP of politics at Crooked Media, I wanted us to talk more about for folks who are not familiar with what your role would entail and giving folks a mm-hmm. sense of what that's like. But maybe we can start with, I know the Crooked Media story. I, I find it interesting and maybe you could share with folks how it all started. It started not too long ago. No, um, we will... We may have turned six already. I'm looking at the calendar. Um, we're somewhere in the six years old range. Um, but yeah, Crooked, um, before Crooked, there was a podcast called Keeping It 1600 that um, mm-hmm. John Favreau, John Lovett, Tommy Vitor, and Dan um, Pfeiffer hosted, all four former Obama staffers. Um, and I remember listening to the podcast in grad school um, because it was kind of how I was keeping up with the election. And then election day happened and their episode after election day, I mean, they, you know, like many of us thought there's no way Donald Trump will win um, the election. And he did. And even though, you know, they seemed to feel guilty that they were so um, certain that Donald Trump wouldn't win. But we I mean, a lot of us were. And we were all living in a bubble, unfortunately. Exactly. Especially, you know, being um, up in Cambridge. And 
I don't know the 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 emotion that they had on that episode. Like I wasn't mad at them. Who could you really be mad at? You know, voters yeah. chose who they chose. Um, but it was just nice to have I don't know someone to experience with and kind of hear from people who were feeling exactly how you felt. And you know, I was not the only person who felt that way because that's why the the podcast did so well. And because of the success of it, they decided to relaunch it under their own company, Crooked Media, which is a play on Donald Trump calling the media crooked, <laughs> um, and uh, launch Pod Save America, which is the, the show that we have now. But the reason they launched um, the podcast, but especially the company, um, well, I should say the company, is because they didn't like the conversation that was happening within political media. They felt like the media played a huge role in Donald Trump being elected uh, by the stories they chose to cover. And then the big part was so often we watch the news, we hear about all the bad things that, that are happening, but no one ever says this is how you can fix it. And that is specifically one of the things that they wanted to do, um, which is why I got hired um, in my yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, you know, it's really cool. And um, if there's time, I can tell the, my story about my failures that led me here. But um, yeah, I, uh, in my second interview, which was with um, Fa John Favreau, which I remember um, when he was talking to me, I was like, Shaniqua, um, you have to speak back. This is not the podcast. <laughs> like he's actually talking to you. Um, but he told me that he said, you know, we never planned to have this position, but we have this huge audience. They are ready to go. And we want to make sure that they're doing the most impactful work that they can be doing. Um, and yeah, that's why I was brought on. And it's, I've been here, it'll be five years in May. Yeah. And it's just, it's been amazing. I couldn't have thought of a better job. And just a quick story about how I even got this job. Yeah, please tell us about your failures. I, um, you know, I, so while I was at the White House, one of our speakers, and I wish I could remember which one, but I know it was either um, Melody Barnes or Robert Gibbs. They had a speaker series for the interns said, I really think it was Melody Barnes, though. She said, um, you know, I know everyone gets up here and tells you about all the highlights of their career. And it sounds like a perfect story, but like we don't get where we are without our failures. And I had plenty of them, you know, before I started working on the Hill, I was trying really hard to go back home and, and work there. Nothing. I could not find a job to save my life. Um, and then when um, Senator Hagan, well, I turned down a job and then Senator Hagan lost. Um, not only did I turn down a job, I um, got into Duke's uh, public policy program. I put in my two weeks notice. I sent my deposit mm. <laughs> and then um, decided not to go. And that was after I had been rejected from Georgetown a couple years before that. And then she lost. But the reason I didn't go to Duke is because I started to think, you know, if I could get in there, maybe I could get into Harvard. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so after she lost, I was able to put the time into the Harvard application. And then I did get in. Um, but to the job that I have now, I was trying very hard to make um, a job happen back in North Carolina. And I wanted to go work for a candidate. And he said yes. And then said, I want you to talk to my new campaign manager. I don't know what the disconnect was there, but it didn't happen. And he said they okay. wanted to, you know, kind of do something else with the position that I wasn't interested in doing what they wanted to do with the position. And so... Um, I don't know if you know Yasmin Raji. She was a year ahead of, um, no. she graduated in 2017 from the Kennedy School. So um, she one day just said, what do you want to do after school? Uh, and I had been thinking on it since that other job didn't work out. And I said, I either want to work at a media company or an organization that has a lot of um, name recognition who can leverage their influence to increase civic engagement. And then she sent me this job and it's, <laughs> and <both>. it's been, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's just been like truly amazing. And, you know, the full circle moment is a woman who worked at the white house during my internship. Um, I had become friends with her and I reached out to her and said, Hey, I'm because she, I know she's, uh, she's married to one of our hosts. Um, and I said, Hey, I'm going to apply for this. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you think it's a good fit? And she was like, Oh my gosh, yes, I'm going to send your stuff in. And, yeah, that's how I how I got here. And so, yeah, Back. I um, I didn't tell all the failures, but just they teach you things. But and plenty they of failures to be. Yeah, yeah, it's not nobody yeah. jumps out of the womb. Perfect. 
no. and being open and having the perspective of this is here to teach me something and how can I get better mm-hmm. or position myself differently is so, so important. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And so glad that you landed at Crooked Media, VP of <laughs> Politics. I personally think they're super lucky to have you. What does VP oh, of Politics entail? What does it entail? Um, so I got promoted in uh, August, so I am still uh, feeling my way around. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and we have um, a new CEO who started in October. So it's been kind of because those were both so happened so close to each other. Um, I kind of like joined senior leadership, but then someone came in to say, OK, this is the, the vision for the company. Um, and so the best way to uh, distill down what I, I do, I think, falls in two buckets. The first, our content brings an audience in and we tell them about all the things that are going on in, in politics. Um, and some of that stuff is beyond, um, you know, your kind of standard politics. We have, I should know this, yeah. we have about 25 shows, I think. You have a um, lot of shows. We went and saw Love yeah. It with Beto Rook oh. in Austin, by the way. Oh, Austin. that is awesome. So, yes. Love it. I, I <laughs> I was about to say, I love, love it. <laughs> it's a great name. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, uh, yeah, so part of it is like shows like Love It or Leave It and Pod Save America, they bring the audience in, talk about what's happening. And then those folks typically want to do something about the things they hear about. And so then they're kind of passed over to my team where we make sure that they're not just listening to the things that they care about and consuming that content, but actually given the tools to take action and try to improve Um, what's going on. And so um, our most successful program was in 2020. It was called Adopt a State. And what we knew is that our audience was in pretty blue places and we wanted to help uh, some Democrats get elected. And so we had to figure out a way to get their energy and talents into states that they didn't live in, hence Adopt a State, where they could pick a state that they wanted to be involved in. And we had 300,000 people sign up for the program and we ended up raising $48 million that year. And so it just, it was a proof point to me that um, when people are committed to making change, they might not know the specific things they need to do, but if you just give them a bit of direction, they, they will, they will surprise you and they will do what needs to be done. And I will say after 2020, I got a little nervous because I thought a lot of people have feelings about Trump, COVID, people were at home, you know, now will everyone just kind of stop paying attention? And 2022 is really a test of, is our theory of change one that makes sense? Does it work? And, um, you know, for, I mean, Crooked Media is a progressive media company. We focus on um, advancing progressive candidates and causes. And what was supposed to be an awful election for Democrats in 2022 ended up not being. And yeah. it was, you know, our program was not as big as it was in 2020, but it was a reminder that if we, again, give our audience the tools that they need to be successful, that they will show up and and help do the things that we ask them to do. Yeah. I feel like many people are really motivated and just want to be shown, Mm -hmm. okay, how can I put this into action? So on that note, what are some of the things that folks can do to promote progressive politics, for instance, on the ground? Yeah. Um, I can't not say something about Vote Save America. It's my little sweatshirt yeah. I have on here. Um, <laughs> so I, w- I will put in some non-Vote Save America stuff. But first, I would encourage folks to go to votesaveamerica.com. And um, I know everyone's asking for your email address. We do not spam anyone. But we, um, you know, you can kind of opt into what you want to do. But we send emails out about um, kind of the baseline is just voter education information, uh, our website will have information. We're updating it now for uh, this year because there are elections this year, not yep. just uh, in even years, um, but information on how to vote in your state. Um, something that we found when we got started was people there, you know, you can't just tell people to vote. It's not always logistically that's it's not always logistically that simple. Um, people need some direction. They need to know when their voter registration deadline is. Um, And so we have all of that on the site, but also if you kind of want to level up and get involved, you can, um, you know, go to the take action section of our website and find ways to uh, engage there. Also, we have a Vote Save America community, which are some of our most engaged volunteers. They, you know, 
I, I think they make the world go round. Um, and that is a place where, in addition to volunteering, they have a lot of social events and are just building real community amongst each other. There are people from, you know, all over the country and they are in the Slack channel, um, you know, encouraging each other. I, I lurk in there a lot. They, hmm. I guess they can't tell that I'm lurking in there, but the <laughs> stories that they share with each other are beautiful. So those are some of the ways through us. But for anyone who just wants to get involved, something that I really encourage people to do is find local organizations where you live. A lot of Vote Save America's work, we uh, funnel money and volunteers, and then we pr um, provide like access to our platform so more people can learn about these organizations. But we really invest in grassroots organizations. We believe the people closest uh, to the ground, closest to the problems, have the best insight and, and solutions. But often those are people who get the least amount of resources to actually yeah. fix them. And so, you know, whatever issue you care about, if it's voting, um, if it's abortion, um, you know, if it's climate, whatever it is, Find a local organization that you can join. If you don't have a ton of time, but you have money to donate, organizations always need money. If you don't have money and you have a lot of time, show up to those volunteer events. Um, you can also go to your local elected leaders, whatever meetings, you know, community meetings they're having, any board meetings that are open to the public. Make your voice heard on the things you care about. One thing that I always tell people working um, on Capitol Hill when I answered the phones, not everyone's calling. Are, and, you know, your elected officials are hearing from the public, but they're hearing from a very small group, yeah. normally who have like a, um, a minority viewpoint on something. But that's who's really driving the interest of um, what the elected official thinks the larger community believes in. So make your voice heard as well. Yeah, it's usually the vocal minority that tends to have maybe more extreme opinions. How about the vision of Crooked Media? What is that? You mentioned a new CEO. Yeah, um, it's interesting. We just had um, uh, all staff retreat, which they had one before I got there in 2018. So for me, it was the first one we ever had. And definitely before I got there, I think there were like 15 employees. So now we're getting closer to 100. So definitely. Wow. It, yeah, it's grown <laughs> tremendously. Um, but um, I'm going to not to be dorky. I'm going to read you the um, Tell me. The mission. I love dorky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read you the mission. And, you know, it was presented at the retreat and made clear that, like, the mission has not um, changed in any way. Um, but it is. At Crooked Media, our goal is to build a, a more equitable, inclusive, and just society through progressive conversation, storytelling, and activism. Form, entertain, and inspire audiences to focus not only on what's broken, but what we can do to fix it. And so, you know, that is literally what we do. We try to educate people on things that are going on, um, on all of our shows. Um, and, you know, I think a perfect example, if I could make a plug, is our show called This Land, um, which mm -hmm. has two seasons. Um, uh, a journalist, Cherokee journalist, um, the, the first... Um, the first season is about a Supreme Court case. It's really interesting. It's about a murder that happens in Oklahoma. And um, there's, I don't think there's any, you know, confusion about whether or not the murder took place and who did it. But the case centers around re whether or not the state of Oklahoma actually had jurisdiction over that murder because it happened on tribal lands. And then it opens up this larger um, question of who actually owns the land in Oklahoma. Um, I mean, if you follow the news, you know how the case ends. But um, uh, if if the Cherokee Nation wins, then they actually own most of the state of Oklahoma or like half of the state, not just the smaller reservation that they have. And the season ends um, on a cliffhanger because the courts decide to punt it to the next term um, when, when the season ended. So it's really good. Um, but yeah, that was something I knew nothing about. And it was really interesting. And so that's what our podcast try to do. Um, just educate people on, on things that are going on. Yeah. yeah. Also, as you were sharing the mission that really resonated with me, another aspect of creating a more progressive society, one where you can take action toward things mm -hmm. that are broken, not just talk about them. What are thoughts on because for me, it also ties back to something you brought up. Maybe Jake was Republican. And what are thoughts on how do we more effectively or just more openly communicate with folks with, from different political affiliations from us? Because at the end of the day, we're all human. 
we're probably influenced by whatever beliefs we grew up around. Mm -hmm. And to me, getting to know one another and share with one another more will hopefully limit or minimize a lot of the polarization that's out there. Because at the end of the day, we're all Americans mm -hmm. and we're all human beings and we all want food and shelter and safety and love and community. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think at the core of that is us spending more time together, getting to know each other better. I was actually at lunch with a friend yesterday and he told me during COVID he had been just, you know, doing research on happiness and loneliness. Um, and that, and this has been talked about before. I even think that um, Professor Seglin brought this up in class and uh, <laughs> he would talk about bowling alone a lot and um, th the book. Um, and people are just spending less time together. And, you know, our communities remain, unfortunately, pretty segregated. And so when people don't get exposed to other kinds of people, um, be it through work, through school, just living in their communities, it's really hard to understand someone else's plight. Um, and I know that it's easier said than done to seek out these people. Um, you know, there was a time where I thought the internet and social media would have the opposite effect that it's having now where we've become more polarized. I thought it would show people more kinds of people and they would be open to, to understanding, yeah. um, the differences that exist. So I, I think that that is like step one to spend some time in areas, communities that you just may not otherwise, um, understand something I did at the Kennedy school after Donald Trump won, I started going to conservative events. Um, I'm pretty, you know, steadfast in the things that I believe, but I did want to understand how do other people arrive at the things that they believe. And when I started working in politics, I very much believed that everyone wanted to improve the country we lived in, the world we live in. They just thought about it in different ways and they had different ways of getting to that um, more more perfect um, world. But something has happened recently where I think some of our leaders have just been bad actors. They have not been interested in actually improving things, but just kind of amassing power and creating havoc. And we, so we also need to get rid of those folks. And that has become even harder because a lot of systems have been changed. Um, a lot of systems have existed, ha ha how they've continued to exist, but been exploited more where it's hard to get rid of these leaders who just refuse to do the right thing. And that's not just in politics. You know, you have some business leaders, whether or not like you agree with capitalism or you hate it. There are some good business leaders and there are some who are not, who just refuse to treat their employees well. And so Sometimes, not to, I'll, I'll end this on a high note, I, I promise, but sometimes it does feel like, you know, so much of the power has been taken away from the people, if you will, that that it's hard to do anything. But so in addition to getting to know other kinds of people, I personally do think getting more active um, in your community really will make a difference. One, it will allow you to meet more people, whether or not they're the same as you. But I have long had the belief that the more people power we have, we can kind of, um, you know, hold our own against the the bigger, more powerful interests. If if collectively we stopped buying something from the company of a CEO who's just really bad, we can make them feel what we want them to do and they will do it. Um, you know, it's the way I think about voting. Like yeah. we're able to use our votes and the more people who vote, the more power we have to overcome the money that has influenced politics so bad. Um, so I would say those are my two things. Spend some more time with people that are different from you that you don't know um, and get involved in your community. And one example I will just throw out there, Heather McGee talks about this a lot, about how she connected with like this white supremacist. Heather McGee is a black woman mm -hmm. who's like very vocal about race in, in this country. And she talks about the time she spent just having all these conversations with this white supremacist and, you know, just it's amazing to hear her talk about it because they were able to see each other and while yeah. she didn't agree with how he came to his beliefs she understood how he came to them and I think even that understanding while it's not going to make a black woman want to be best friends with a white supremacist I think it will help us think about how we solve some of these problems in a way that's not just well I don't like you and that's it because in a way that's not charged, yeah. but more productive exactly. because we're working with other humans. Yeah, focused on progress. Came about, mm -hmm. right, Focus on progress. We'll link it in the show notes. All right, Shaniqua, and let's turn this now back to you. So 
we talked a little bit at the beginning of Shaniqua growing up, how she got involved in politics, and you're having such a meaningful impact today. What is important to you these days? Yeah, um, kind of tied to what we just talked about. And again, I, the example I used for Heather McGee is an extreme one, but I think it really speaks to how, you know, open people can be. So something that's really important to me is progress. I know that sounds very, you know, kind of straightforward, um, but there, as we become more polarized, um, I think people have really dug into like whatever side of whatever issue they believe in or on whatever side of the ideological spectrum they're on. And that is something even just thinking about Democrats alone. There are, there's a spectrum and, and people on either sides of um, an issue. And I think that unfortunately, in an effort to, you know, really kind of demonstrate their values, a lot of people have become really rigid in what they're willing to kind of compromise on, pers other perspectives they're willing to consider. And it feels like a race to be right instead of actually making progress. Um, I can list out all of my values, the things I believe. Um, and I will say my values are kind of the anchor in all of this. Um, but I can list out everything that I believe. But if, if believing those things with no progress um, is the choice, and the other choice is compromising on a few of those things so that we can see some change, I do think it's important to see some change. Progress it doesn't just come overnight. It takes a lot of effort and you have to keep pushing and pushing. And I much rather push for the small thing that leads to the bigger thing than just remain in one spot until the big thing comes because it may never come. And so we need to get as much as we can. And um, I think the 2020 election is a perfect example. Um, you know, I will say this, I did not vote for Joe Biden in the primary, but when he was the nominee, that is the person that I worked to help get elected. And a lot of people would often ask, well, I, or say, you know, I don't like him. I, I don't want to elect him. Um, I don't want incremental change. I want big change. And well, I will say part of that is <laughs> a failure of our education system to accurately describe how um, our, right. our government works. The other part um, is it's a pretty privileged position to say, I'm going to stick, I'm going to stay right here until I get everything that I want. When there are people whose livelihood, who, you know, whether or not they eat the next day, whether or not they will wake up in the morning, depends on that small bit of progress that we are able to get from someone like a Joe Biden, who I actually think has surprised a lot of progressives and done more than, than expected. But that's valuable to me. Um, and so progress is something that's important to me now. And I, I hope that more people will get focused on um, that instead of instead of being right. So true. How about Shaniqua? How are you taking care of yourself these days? Yes, I know. How do I do a little for me? Well, today I have therapy. I have that twice a week. Uh, Not twice a week, twice a month. Every, <laughs> um, every other week. Um, Bi-weekly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but something that I like just demand of myself is to um to to get exercise in or or walks which walks are exercise but like this morning yesterday was kind of rough and so this morning um I went for a four mile run and the weather was perfect uh, well actually it rained but it was perfect like I just needed to get a lot of anxiety out um and yeah. it was the rain move night. your body <laughs> yeah yeah and so it was beautiful. And, you know, sometimes I'll just go for a walk so that my mind, as someone who's like, okay, you got to get all this stuff done. I know in the past, I had less time to just let my mind be at ease and let thoughts just kind of roam around because I felt like that was not a good use of time. But, um, you know, in the honestly, when COVID started and I wanted to get out of the house, I would go on walks and I started to see that clearing my mind, like, some of my best ideas would come to me during those walks. And so those are some of the ways that I take care of myself other than like wearing sweatshirts and, and sitting in this chair. And sitting in your bold chair, <laughs> bringing it back full circle. This was so, so, so much of a treat for me. I adored having you. Thank, Thank you, you for, for having time. me. This was, this was great. And it felt like, it felt like a little therapy. So I appreciate the invite. Yay. Yay.
Hey, that's great. All right, we'll wrap it there. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave a review and share.